Okay, let's talk about Good Time. The 2017 film, directed by the Safdie brothers and starring Robert Pattinson, is one of the most intense crime thrillers of the 2010s. It's a story about a man named Connie, a criminal narcissist, and Nick, his mentally disabled brother. The story revolves around a bank robbery gone wrong, where Nick ends up getting arrested in the process. The rest of the film follows Connie as he attempts to right the wrongs of his failed robbery attempt falling deeper and deeper into a hole that is increasingly more difficult to climb out of. This film is a lot to process on its first viewing. The aesthetics of the film are both visually pleasing and visceral. The uncomfortable close-up shots throughout the film give it a very claustrophobic feeling, making you feel almost trapped within the film's environment. The dialogue comes off as extremely naturalistic, almost like a documentary rather than a fictional film. And when you add the synth-heavy soundtrack provided by Daniel Lopatin, you get this barrage of both complementary and contrasting filmmaking that adds to the anxiety that is presented through the film's storytelling. In my opinion, the overall aesthetics of the film help elevate Good Time beyond a simple crime drama. But, with that being said, I'm not going to specifically talk about the aesthetics of Good Time. To be completely frank, Uncut Gems succeeded in creating a similar aesthetic. The claustrophobic shooting style, the intense pacing, and the synth soundtrack, it's all there. And given the fact that Uncut Gems is much more popular in comparison to Good Time, I feel like it's important to talk about what makes Good Time unique and, in my opinion, more impactful. In order to understand the film's impact, we have to answer a pretty straightforward question. Why do we, as the audience, care about Connie? A simple response to this question could be Connie's love for his brother. Throughout the whole film, we see Connie as this helpless romantic, one that's willing to do anything in order to get his brother out of jail. We see a brother that promises Nick a brand new life for both of them, one without the burden of the city or past transgressions. See, Connie might do some bad things along the way, but his actions are coming from a place of love. Therefore, we forgive him, right? Well, I don't think it's that simple. While yes, I do think Connie loves his brother, I also think he manipulates him as well. His speech he gives to Nick right after the bank robbery is a pretty clear example of that. And on top of that, he also lacks any sort of empathy towards the people around him, his girlfriend, Ray, the security guard, Crystal, all of these characters end up being used and abused by Connie in order for him to reach his goal. His actions, even if he himself believes they are selfless, are actually quite selfish in nature. So if it's not love that makes Connie a redeemable character, what is it? Why do we care about Connie as a character? To answer this question, I think it's important to look at the Safdie brothers' previous filmography. Some of their most well-known films up to this point of making Good Time included Heaven Knows What, Daddy Long Legs, and Lenny Cook. Heaven Knows What was a story about a girl struggling with her addiction to heroin, where the main actress went through similar struggles in her own life. Daddy Long Legs was a story about a somewhat absent father taking care of his kids for two weeks. And that story was loosely based on the director's relationship with their father. And Lenny Cook was literally a documentary on Lenny Cook, a high school basketball prodigy who could not capitalize on his dreams of playing basketball professionally. All of the characters in these films had a backdrop to fall back on. The actress from Heaven Knows What was able to look back on her struggles with drug addiction in order to give a more accurate performance in her film. The father from Daddy Longlegs was able to use stories given by the directors in order to portray his character more accurately. And Lenny Cook was able to relive his past struggles in order to help create a realistic tone for his documentary. These choices, along with the many non-actors present in many Safdie Brother films, add a sense of realism that is impossible to emulate in a purely fictional film. But 
the Safdie brothers don't believe that's the case. We ended up writing a really, we trying to learn the character, so we started writing his backstory, and the backstory was arguably harder to write than the screenplay, because it was minute one of life to minute one of the movie. What, what is his backstory, if you can flesh it out? Is that, uh, he says this in the movie, he says that he alludes to it a, a, a couple times that his father, yeah, his father's died, uh, and he lives with, and the mother is estranged, uh, issues with, with uh, substance abuse, and they live with their grandmother, Nick and, and Connie. Um, just don't forget about the uncle's the car dealership. I might, I might forget about that. <laughs> I might forget about that part. Essentially, he grows up with a very, you know, in this hostile sort of negative environment, uh, living with his uh, brother um, and his grandmother. He goes down a bad road. He ends up in prison. In prison, he has a kind of... Um, I guess it's a kind of enlightenment, you know, I don't know if it comes from reading the Bible and running across Joseph, but he suddenly sort of fancies himself as this kind of provider, that he has a mission, that he has, um, that his sort of purpose in life, which he's never sort of felt before, is to reconnect with this brother. In building a whole backstory, filled with trauma and neglect, as well as a whole experience as an inmate, you suddenly remove the character from Connie, and instead, you make Connie a real person. This extensive storyline to Connie's life actually helps make some of his less redeemable qualities more understandable in context. The first quality that comes to mind is the fact that Connie is straight up a pathological liar. In many instances in the film, Connie seamlessly strings together lies in order to push through whatever obstacle is in front of him. There are points in this film where it feels as if Connie believes in his own lies, and that his reality is separate from others. You know, like, like any kind of con man, uh, every, every lie is a truth, but I think to Connie, it becomes almost more of a truth than, uh, than the average liar. Um, I think as he has, he's so, uh, he has so much conviction to his purpose, but like he convinces himself very, very, very quickly. And I think all these times there's this scene and there's another scene when I'm talking to a, a, a cop in the hospital and it was, we were talked about it a lot at the beginning when it's, he's lying, but he's not lying. It's like he's, it's, <laughs> he'll, he'll create these stories in his head and it's kind of, it's no longer a lie to him. As he's saying this, this, these, uh, this story, it's like, it's, it's true. When you put into context that his childhood was filled with negative energy, with his father passing away and his mother battling a drug addiction, it would make sense for a kid to lie to himself, to create a fantasy world where the negative aspects of his life didn't exist, and how lying to himself can actually make him feel better about his overall surroundings. As Connie gets older, this coping mechanism develops beyond simply coping and instead engulfs his personality where he himself can't distinguish between reality and a lie. This adds a lot of emotional weight to the final scene involving Connie, where you can see the genuine confusion on his face, slowly recognizing that his reality might have been a fantasy world all along, and that the atrocities he committed during the film were real, that there were direct consequences for his immoral actions. Another aspect that could have distorted Connie's reality is the fact that he was once a prisoner himself. This distortion of reality can be explained by a simple anecdote mentioned to the Safdie brothers during the pre-production of Good Time. A former prisoner mentions that once you're out of jail, you keep bumping into things and knocking them over. He then goes on to explain that while in jail, everything is bolted down and that it becomes a habit to bump into things just to feel something. Once you're out of jail, simply put, furniture and tables are not bolted down anymore. Things get knocked over and broken, and now there are suddenly consequences that didn't exist beforehand. This sudden shift between the prison system and a functioning society also helps explain Connie's narcissism, which develops from his enlightenment while in jail. This enlightenment gave Connie a mission to help Nick escape the city life. This made him feel as if his actions had more weight than others, and that him and his brother's life had more value than others. 
With the extreme isolation that comes with the prison system, one could make the argument that Connie's decision making stemmed from a selfish place since he was only able to think from a selfish perspective for an extended period of time. This sense of adapting to the prison lifestyle is further explained in the book In the Belly of the Beast by Jack Abbott, a book that inspired the Safdie brothers while writing this film. Quote, I feel as if I ever did adjust to the prison system, I could by that alone never adjust to society. Unquote. These examples show that the trauma and experiences Connie went through throughout his life have a direct impact on his character's decision making in the film. Now, does this backstory make him a likable character? No, of course not. He's still pretty unlikable. And even if his past had a direct impact on his decision making, that doesn't suddenly make him immune to any responsibility. But, then again, Pure innocence is not necessary in order to be a redeemable character. No, in order for a character to be redeemable, in order for us to give a character a second or a third or a fourth or even a fifth chance, the character in question has to prove to us that it is human. If we are only able to perceive a character through the actions shown during the film's runtime, and those actions are deemed immoral or just wrong, then it is impossible to empathize. But if through the acting, character development, and the screenplay, they show that there is more to this character, more than just what's written in the script, we start to view this character less like a character and more like a human. A human who has flaws, a human who has experienced trauma and hardships, and a human that has been permanently altered by its surroundings. We don't empathize with Connie because he's a good person. We empathize with Connie because he's a person in the first place.